Namaste, and welcome to another episode of <laughs> Uladu Narpadu. I'm telling you what, making these videos is such an incredible journey because it takes me deep into the meaning and the practice of Bhagwan's slokas. You know, I have this principle that I don't speak on anything that I haven't tried or experienced. So I get to go into every one of these slokas really deeply before doing a video on them. And I hope that makes it more authentic and immediate for you. So let's look at today's disputing. The reality exists. It does not exist. It has form. It is formless. It is one, non-dual. It is two, dual. It is neither non-dual nor dual, etc. Is ignorance born of illusion, maya? Give up all such disputes. Firmly abide as the reality, which always exists without even a single thought as the nature of everyone, knowing that reality in the heart by the mind merging within. So, <laughs> if you go back a few years to the beginning of uh, this YouTube channel, when I was a Buddhist monk, at least externally, <laughs> Uh, some of these discussions came up because people were asking this Nibbana or Nirvana that the Buddha was talking about, is it real? Uh, or is it something just uh, like uh, a carrot for the donkey, you know, a goal to lead us in a certain way? And of course, I came to the conclusion that Yes, it's real, but in a way it's also a fabrication. Why? Because the state of Nibbana, being a non-conceptual state, is also an objective state. In other words, it seems to exist outside of oneself, and one can perceive it as something separate from oneself. Of course, it's wonderful and blissful and amazing and beautiful and all kinds of, of wonderful things. But it's not the end. Actually, it's only the beginning. <laughs> For example, every experience we have, we have two ways to approach it two ways to look at it or experience it. For example, here I'm looking out the window here, and I could say, I see a field, I see some trees, I see a fence, and some buildings off in the distance, birds flying past, clouds in the sky, huh? in the beautiful afternoon light, in the rainy season. So, what did I just do? I deconstructed this experience into symbols, and I made it separate from myself. I made it something that I can look at and consider as a bunch of pieces the ground, the trees, the fence, the sky. I made them all separate by using symbols. Now in reality, <laughs> the other way to look at it is as a single whole, a gestalt as the psychiatrist would say. One perception and actually, it's not clear where does the ground end 
Where does the tree begin? Where does the tree end and where does the sky begin? Where does the sky end? Where does the bird begin? See? There is no word for that hole. Huh? Because each hole that we encounter, we'd have to invent a new word for. I mean, it's bad enough that people manufacture all kinds of useless things and then give them new names as if they were actually something new. So now we have all these brand names, Coca-Cola and Chevrolet and all these different names. What do they actually mean? Because the things that they designate are actually a collection of hundreds or even thousands of parts, all made by different people, assembled and sold as a unit. So really, the name, well, of course, the name is not the thing. The name is never the thing. But when we use names, we are talking about either an artificial fabrication, putting a bunch of pieces together into one unit, or an artificial deconstruction, taking one perception and breaking it up into a bunch of symbols and that then we can uh, manipulate easily in our minds. See, it's very easy to assign names to this view out my window and then talk about it as names. But it's very difficult to go into the actual experience of what it is and encounter each thing as it is, without names, without thoughts. Now, Nibbana, Nirvana, enlightenment, and similar high states of mind are, in some ways, fabrications, because we're putting together a lot of separate things. Our state of mind, our way of thinking, our way of looking at things, the way we feel about it, how it affects us, and so on. And we're trying to give it a name, Nibbana. Huh? But are any two experiences alike? No. So even Nibbana is not one thing. It's many, many things, many, many experiences. But all those experiences have how could I say, a certain flavor, a certain taste. And that taste is, we are not using words, we are not using symbols. We're neither um, separately assigning names to everything and breaking it up by analysis, nor are we concatenating it together by means of some kind of synthesis. The thing just is what it is, <laughs> and it can't really be described. And to attempt to describe it means we lose the immediate experience of it. It becomes an abstraction. It becomes something separate from our self, from our being. It loses the immediacy and the aliveness of the authentic encounter. So, all these high states of being, nirvana, huh? or contemplation of the self, are indescribable by nature. So what's the use of arguing about them? The only use words have in this connection is to describe how to attain these states, or at least kind of point a finger in a certain direction and say, go over there and take a look. <laughs> go that way and just explore. Huh? There's something cool over there. Something wonderful. So when we argue about these things, you know, there are a lot of people teaching and presenting about spiritual subjects on the internet and here in 
where I live and uh, in so many other venues. I don't get involved anymore with trying to say, well, your teaching is different from my teaching, and it says in this book that blah, 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 you know. I just don't get involved in it. There's no juice in it anymore. Because what everyone is experiencing is, in many cases, different. And in many cases, it could be the same. But maybe they speak about it differently. Or maybe they don't speak about it at all. So then how are we to know? Huh? Am I sharing my inmost heart with you? Not really. Not really. It would be difficult because where are the words to describe it? If all we have is words, and on the internet basically <laughs> that's all we have to share is words, and you can maybe get a little taste of some energy. But words alone will not give us the real juice that we're looking for. So that's why I don't try to perform or emote or share anything beyond just you know, the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you can ask anybody that, that really knows me, huh? like Skandamurti. I'm this way all the time. It's not like this is a face that I put on for being on video. This is just my ordinary way of being. So, <laughs> what can I say about people who want to argue philosophy? Bhagwan here says it's ignorance, born of illusion. Maya. What is that Maya? Maya is the idea that we can express or describe or share or manipulate things by means of words and symbols. It's a false promise. Huh? Just like the whole idea of selfish action. Karma. Kamya karma. Huh? The Upadesha Undiyar begins with a description of a bunch of uh, priests out in the forest performing karma kanda rituals for their own selfish benefit. They wanted wealth, fame, knowledge, mystic powers, and so on. And he describes this as ignorance. Now, m maybe these guys were using a spiritual or a semi-spiritual technology that is far ahead of what anybody has today. But they were still ignorant. Why? They were using it for their own selfish benefit. They were not using it to help others. They were not using it to improve the world. They were only using it for their own benefit. Greedy, selfish, self-centered. And we have a similar situation today where a very small group of people, comparatively small group of people, own most of the wealth in the world and control most of the assets on the planet. Are they doing it for the good of humanity? No, <laughs> they're doing it for their own good. So this is ignorance. This is Maya. They think that by doing this, they're going to get happiness, but actually all they get is trouble. Once you obtain something, once you acquire something, then you have to struggle to get it. And once you get it, you have to struggle to keep it. And guess what? Ultimately, it's not possible. Ultimately, that thing is going to go away. That's just the way the world is. The only thing that doesn't go away is consciousness, is the self, pure awareness. So that is what we should be cultivating. That is what we should be looking into. Because everything is going to go away, even this body and what to speak of the whole world that we see. And we're going to have to go someplace else and start all over again.
<laughs> so the reality is a state of mind devoid of words and symbols. And we can abide in this reality. Uh, the Buddha called it pleasant abiding. We can abide in this reality as the seer, not the seen, because the scene is always changing. Even if it's something very wonderful and exalted like visions of heaven or angels or nirvana, nibbana, huh? meditation, ecstasy, all these things come and go. So why should we occupy our time with these temporary things? Instead, cultivate the self, the seer, the knower instead of the known, the seer instead of the seen. That is the gateway to real durable happiness. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om.